like I said, worked with now hundreds of companies that have implemented data mesh. And I'm super excited today to have uh, Tomas Caracciarto with us. He's the engineering lead and senior architect at Shell. And he's gonna talk about Shell's journey to data mesh and also tell us about how Shell is really bringing in a new world of clean energy. Thank you, Tomas. Hey, Tomer. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks, thanks. Well, fantastic, it's so great to be here. And I'm really, really excited to share our story today. So, but before we dive into the nitty gritty details of our, our data journey, uh, I need to talk about a few things, okay? Uh, to give you a little bit of context. So there are three things here, the energy transitioning one, the <clears throat> company as, and how it relates to it and try to take a leadership role in that transitioning and a little bit about digitalization, how machine learning, AI, data and software is really tying this all together. So <clears throat> energy transitioning is basically the world trying to move towards clean energy. They try to move towards clean energy, but at the same time, try to decarbonize and try to uh, drive towards net zero emissions. And this seems to be quite a bit of a challenge because the world is still needing more and more energy, right? The demand is growing. And this is really where our company is coming into the picture at Shell. We like to take a leadership role in this transition and, and help with that challenge. But in order to do that, our company really realized that <clears throat> we needed to um, uh, transform its business, right? And this transformation is what we are referring to powering progress. What you see on the screen is the four pillars of powering progress. First and foremost, we really like to generate value to our shareholders and do this in a profitable manner. We like to partner up <clears throat> with our customers, businesses and governments across various sectors in order to help them drive towards net zero emissions. Uh, at the same time, still respecting nature by reducing waste and contributing to our uh, biodiversity. And we are powering lives and, and livelihoods and uh, really <clears throat> trying to ensure that this transition is, is happening successfully and, and profitably. So energy transitioning. Um, <clears throat> there are two major mega trends that we see that's going to really shape our lives in this next 10 years. Um, besides the uh, energy systems uh, becoming really kind of decentralized, digitalization is also a key factor as machine learning, AI, and software really now, not just having a large impact on all these different business models that are being created, but at the same time, they are defining new business models, which is a quite interesting phenomenon. But let's go back to the um, power value chain and this uh, decentralization kind of concept a little bit. So a couple of years ago, right, the power value chain was quite simple. Simple in a sense that, we had a few large uh, power plants that were basically generating electricity. That electricity got transmitted and distributed across the wire. And of course, because electricity wasn't something you could store indefinitely, it needed to be balanced in real time, right? Supply and demand always needed to be in balance. So that, that was one of the difficulties. But in a sense, it was fairly simple because uh, these large power plants were just generating electricity and consumers at the end were just tapping into the grid and consuming it. So what changed? What really changed was <clears throat> the emergence and uh, the appearance of these different uh, renewable energy sources, right? Solar, wind, batteries, electrical vehicles. And so, so now what really happens is that these large power plants are being completely kind of distributed across <clears throat> the, the overall grid. And millions and millions of these minor, smaller generations are started, starting to <clears throat> kind of contributing into the mix. And this really makes things complex. If you think about it, people can put solars on their rooftops and they can generate electricity and <clears throat> uh, contribute back to the grid. Then the batteries come into the picture. People can actually do this thing called load shedding or load shaping, which means basically that you are using your battery when the electricity prices are really high and then you're, you're, you're <coughs> charging it actually when they are really low. So this really introduced a lot of new behaviors, a lot of uh, <clears throat> new kind of uh, challenges and, 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 and all kinds of facets. And that's what really kind of brings us to, to the story today because one of the things across this complexity uh, that really 
kind of makes a company or, or anyone stand out is the ability to be able to forecast the consumption of electricity, right? If we know how much is going to be the demand and how much is going to be the consumption, then we can, we can really prepare for it better. <clears throat> um, so this is where one of our um, internal organizations, a power retail organization, really decided to um, <clears throat> expand on their existing forecasting capability and uh, build their own. So <clears throat> hopefully now you, you're able to see that um, with all these transformations, um, whereas this always been kind of a compute problem because um, uh, time series forecasting has been always around, but now with all these different facets, it's really now transforming into a data problem, okay? And this is that data problem that I wanted to talk to you about today, not necessarily about the forecasting that has its own kind of intricacies in terms of what uh, techniques and approaches are being used, but really about what the data challenges uh, uh, brought us and, and, and needed to, to solve. Okay, so it all really came down to speed, right? And as Tomer was talking about um, self-service and, <clears throat> and performance. So what we were dealing with is kind of the classical situation of having large volume of data residing in different data uh, sources, and we really needed to be able to tap into these data sources without building all complex kind of ETLs, which would take a lot of time, allowing our data analysts, data engineers, um, product people to really contribute to this and kind of get it to the data scientists so they can start doing their magic, build all those magical algorithms, and then eventually put them into production and operationalize them. So the two, two key kind of challenges I'd really like to hone in on was one of these <coughs> uh, around the data volume and, and again, enabling these people without writing a whole lot of code to, to kind of serve the data and, and move these data products along this kind of chain up to the, to the data scientists. And then just one kind of interesting example when, when we uh, <coughs> were supplying, supplying data to the data scientists and then one day they come back and say, hey, Jupyter Notebook is crashing, what's happening? So, well, let's take a look. No wonder it's crashing because you're trying to load kind of 80 gigs worth of data. So in memory, that's not gonna work. And by the way, you have about a 15 step join in here. And oh, let's just see one of the uh, <coughs> unique IDs might be not so unique, right? So what do you do? You basically refactor, push it down the stack and try to enable them and move forward uh, as, as quick as possible. The other one was around when <coughs> we try to put these uh, uh, inference models into production and it turns out that we need to run about 100 of them concurrently and it's, it's about it was about uh, six or eight billion records uh, that needed to be retrieved like within about a couple minutes right so so that whole timeline really needed to be condensed to be able to uh, allow people to to go through this and and achieve this okay so here's the the architecture, uh, <clears throat> Dremio was kind of a natural choice and really gave us a huge uplift as a compute engine to be able to address this because we were able to, again, tap into these resources, data sources, and have like really quick iterations before we unleash the data engineers to write ETLs and so forth. So VDSs were flying and then PDSs were flying and then we all kind of got to the reflections, right? And we were joking about like, how is your reflection doing? <clears throat> and um, when they started getting some love and some, some hugs, then those got hugged and then got a little bit kind of choked. So we needed to allocate a little bit more juice behind it and isolate them. But overall, <clears throat> I can say that it's been um, a, a pretty positive journey. And um, I can't say that we are completely over it, right? And, and we have those um, high accuracy forecasts and, and, and it's all hunky dory. But where we are really got to is in the stage where now we can push through this, the different high volume of data with, with relative ease. We have the process, all the collaboration, all those people safely can kind of publish their data sets and, and, and it's all working. So here's another view um, of what we've created. Um, and what really made us realize was that this actually became like a mini data mesh, right? The data has been residing in, in different sources, uh, mostly distributed, and this unified access layer 
really provided a great abstraction from all that complexity, allowing the <clears throat> data engineers and data analysts to, to contribute, provision different spaces, and then really kind of in a, a, a visible and very dynamic fashion, allow the data products to evolve and, and really kind of hit the various customer levels. And in this case, we had basically customers, the, the data scientists, and then we also had the end customers who were consuming these forecasts. And along the way, we also realized that we have actually generated a lot of very <coughs> valuable data sets that, that they actually really like consuming. So all these learnings uh, kind of really gave us the impression that now we have most of the, if not all the characteristics of a, of a data mesh. And, and really like to bank on these, these learnings um, in the future. So some of the additional things, uh, just to mention, the iterative data model was actually a, a pain in the butt in the first, um, but <clears throat> we realized that we really needed to refactor this constantly and, and, and just yeah, going back to that uh, scenario where that 15 plus joins with a not so unique ID, right? We, we were able to really jump on it because of the, the visibility that, that the, the lineage provided us. Uh, um, but something really had, we, 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 we kind of uh, had to deal with. Uh, on the other hand, the, the Dremio uh, <coughs> compute engine is, is uh, a sophisticated kind of, kind of beast, right? So when you have used these reflections, then you really kind of want to, uh, be careful as to how you treat them and allocate enough memory and isolate them and so forth because once they become successful and famous then they really get famous right and take on um, and then finally the fine-grained access control that was an absolute key because this way that we can provision these these uh, spaces and safely securely assign it to Azure Active Directory groups really kept our IRM comrades and friends, you know, uh, <coughs> at bay, and 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 they remained our friends. So so that's a that's a really good thing. So overall, yeah, really great experience. Um, if you are interested in more details, please go to our breakout session. Thank you very much. Really appreciate being here and listening to our story. Thank you guys and enjoy the conference.